resurrection gives us a new hope, a living hope, a hope for a better world. And I've titled today's message, A Hope for a Better World. All ancient cultures and civilization like the Chinese, the Babylonian, the Greek, the Roman, and the Eastern civilization or the culture in India had different views on man's progress. And they say that this ancient view of progress is cyclic or it is just repeating again and again. You get to a peak of progress and then you decline, come to the rock bottom and then again man strives to come back and it is a constant process of cycle. But with the 21st century and the late 20th century, uh, the world started seeing progressive development in how we look at life. With the invention of the printing press in 1436 by Gutenberg, we can find the revolution of information with the print media where printed material and communication could reach people in their hands as books. And we must understand that Gutenberg took up the uh, job of printing the first Bible called as the Gutenberg Bible and the press was used for various other publications. And it started an altogether revolution on information being handed over in written format in the hands of people. And then comes the industrial revolution. I'm talking about man's linear progression of life and the industrial revolution in 1750 brings in another change of human living and life and expectancy, it has taken us to the very next level. And the age that we are living in today is the digital age. In 1980, with the invention of the internet and computers, it has taken the progress of man to the very next level and it is a linear ascent to man's comfort and success in the world that we are living in with all these linear revolutions and the growth of man and the comfort of man and the technological growth and growth in science which is just going from a small graph to a high graph every generation is expected to have better livelihood and better way of living with this linear progress but man does not understand that as there is so much of development and growth in the world it is there for the world, but it ends when that particular man dies. No matter what achievement the world has gone through or we have achieved, with our death, all this progress comes to a standstill and we are back to ground zero. Steve Jobs, we know this name, very famous Steve Jobs, who co-founded Apple and delivered the smartphones that we have in our hands and and he was the one who first commercially, successfully, personal computer was made by him and made it commercially available for people worldwide. Steve Jobs, such a great man who just grew and took that organization up, died at a young age of 56 in 2011. So the greatest of the inventors and the greatest of the people who are in the who's who of the society their progress also ends with man's death. Man advance and advance and advance eventually to lose it all and to go back to a six foot grave. But the message of resurrection is, is a message of Christianity that gives a progressive linear hope for man even beyond this world. You know that's where Christianity comes into effect. It does not stop with this world. It does not end with this world. The progressive growth that we have as Christians and the hope that we have, it does not stop with death, but it continues to grow. And all through eternity, there is a growth in Christ-likeness and in the new life that God has given to us. And that's made possible just because of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christianity talks about life after death. And where did that hope come from? It comes from the resurrection of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus today talks to the world that there is hope for every human being. 
there is hope for the redemption of families culture society and there is hope for a better world in this world covered with sickness and sin and wickedness there is hope for a better world because jesus rose again from the grave there is eternity for human race and hope for a better you if you believe in jesus christ come with me to the narrative where jesus died on the cross in matthew chapter 27 And when Jesus was on his cross remember his disciples most of his male disciples had deserted him and by on the day of betrayal they are all just gone different ways they lost all hope but when Jesus was dying on the cross there were some devout disciples right near the cross there were women disciples and John says the beloved disciple was standing and observing everything regarding Jesus as crucifixion and they are the eye witnesses of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ when the crowd left when the centurion left and the soldiers left there just remained this Joseph of Arimathea a rich disciple and uh, Nicodemus another rich disciple whom we find in the earlier pages of the gospel of John this rich people have somehow managed to sneak through the camel's eye according to jesus's word and they remain disciples of jesus and when they saw that jesus has paid for their lives with his life they were willing to risk their life to go to pilate and ask for the body of jesus and somebody over here was willing to give his newly dug grave for jesus and they bring jesus and i don't think it is just joseph of arimathea just lift up jesus and come he is a rich man he has got lot of people around him so this group of people come and take this lifeless body of jesus and bring it inside the tomb close the tomb and then the chief priest goes and asks the uh, pilot for some protection around the tomb because there is a rumor that his disciples may carry away the body and tell it as a fake resurrection so there is a roman seal on that tomb and the roman guards are guarding and everybody went sabbath had set in it's dark no hope the son of god has gone down like a setting sun with no hope of resurrection but in that tomb scene we can find a couple of people who are waiting hopeless this woman disciples are mentioned over there they were waiting in the dark because they had lost hope where are they from they are all the way from galilee up north and have traveled with jesus for a long time they have invested their money their time their effort all for the kingdom of god because jesus just inaugurated the kingdom and he is giving them the message of peace and message of the coming kingdom so they were so joyfully following jesus investing their life money and all the resources by the way this woman were funding jesus's ministry and now the men have gone back to their profession but what can this humble woman do they are left helpless far away from galilee they do not know what to do and they're just sitting beside the closed tomb of jesus without any hope they go back to their homes and spend the sabbath quiet not talking to one another they're all in their rooms in absolute mourning and early sunday morning when the sabbath rules have been taken off while it was still dark they run to the tomb of jesus and in matthew chapter 28 we can find the mention of the resurrection of jesus in chapter 28 and is verse one after the sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week mary magdalene and the other mary went to the look at the tomb there was a violent earthquake for an angel of the lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb rolled the back the stone and sat on it his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men and this women are there they are seeing something unusual happening over there and verse 5 the angel said to the women do not be afraid after that dark night at calvary and the death of the son of god what is the first word from heaven to come to a hopeless mankind do not be afraid and therein we get the message of god on the resurrection sunday for the entire world in this world you have reasons to be afraid in this world your hopes will go down like a sunset 
but irrespective of what happens to you there is hope in Christ and Christianity talks loud and clear to the world today you don't have to be afraid because son Jesus has risen from the grave that is the announcement of the angels because this woman were afraid human beings are afraid we are afraid of various things in our life job and friendship uh medical struggles that we go through loneliness rejection death cancer pain you name it covid 19 we have various things to be afraid of in this fallen world and the message of god to the fallen humanity is not to be afraid because of the resurrection of the lord and savior jesus christ for i know that you are looking for jesus who was crucified was six he is not here he has risen just as he said come and see the place where he lay then quickly go and tell his disciples He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. Now listen to this verse uh, of Matthew. Was the next verse, verse eight. So the woman hurried. So the woman saw the empty tomb and the message of the angels. There is some comfort that has come to them that their Messiah, their Savior, has risen from the grave. They are happy, and now they are running towards the other disciples to convey this news. They are excited. But look at the emotion of the woman over here was 8. So the woman hurried away from the tomb afraid yet filled with joy. I think Matthew wants us to understand something about human life over here. They heard that Jesus has risen from the grave, so there is hope for them. Yet in their humanity they are afraid but mixed with joy. This is the tension of Christian life. If you come to Christ does not mean that you will not be afraid. We are not immune to the things that happen in this fallen world. That's why we bury people. That's why there is cancer. That's why there is COVID-19. That's why there is job loss and problems in relationships. In spite of having Christ, there can be times where we go through dark nights and can have seasons of fear in our lives. but the beauty of christianity is in the midst of the fears that can come to a common man there is the joy of the risen christ that can give us peace and keep us going because there is joy in the risen savior today you have come with your fears maybe some of you are going through tough times you do not know you are your son has set like this woman hopeless not knowing what to do but in the midst of that the joy of christianity is that he fills you with hope and joy irrespective of what your struggles are in your life and that's a beautiful tension that matthew picks up and that's why sometimes we wonder to ourselves after following christ why am i afraid why am i burying the dead yes Christ is in us but it is not come in our body we are body is still in the flesh and the resurrection of Jesus gives the renewed hope for humanity that he who began a good work in us is able to translate this body into a glorified body like that of Christ where the things of this fallen world will never affect us again and that's the hope of a renewed humanity in Christ Jesus what happened in the garden of eden god created man and woman and put them in a perfect environment there was no cemetery that god made in the garden of eden there was no traveling to husur road cemetery in the garden of eden this was not god's plan but the wickedness of evil brought in death and decay with it comes all the evil systems of this world murder of cain and abel power and prestige of the tower of babel incest position power money every every evil we find in the bible just because of that fall and then when the first adam failed in the garden and brought humanity and all of us into such a situation where there is fear and death and decay the second adam jesus christ He took our penalty on the cross and he rose again on the third day with a glorified body so that we too have the hope of a glorified body where we will overcome this evil and forever we will be with God. Can I hear an amen church? Amen. Look at the resurrected Jesus. He appeared to his disciples, isn't it? So when he appeared to his disciples, did they recognize that he is Jesus? Yes. That means The resurrected Jesus is a human. You could touch him. 
God incarnate has taken humanity and being 100% God to identify with us. So he is human and God, the resurrected Jesus. And this human God is coming back again. We will see him face to face. And then, when the doubting disciple wanted to touch the nail-pierced hands and feel those pain of Jesus, Jesus allowed him to touch. So it is a body that can be touched. And he went through those scars and those marks of Jesus by the side. That means, if Pastor Shine is 5 foot 7 inch in this world, the perfect body that God gives me is not 6 foot 6 inch. I'm going to be the same shine. You're going to be the same you. But the limitations of evil in that body will not be a limitation for you. People will recognize you just as you are. You will not turn into a supermodel when Christ comes. We are all human beings created in the image of God. We will be just like that we are. But our limitations will no more be a limitation in the perfect world. In the way that God has created you, it will not be a problem for to fulfill the purpose of God because he will create a new humanity out of you, a new man with the same feature, a glorified body. And that's the hope of resurrection. Pastor Shine can go to the grave and in the coming of the Lord, I can rise up with a body like that of Christ. But that body will not have the limitations of this evil world that body will not visit the cemetery anymore. There is no more pain. There is no more darkness. There is no more evil. It will be restored back to the garden level. And that's the whole story of the Bible. And that restoration is not only for the human body. But the earth is also going to experience that restoration. And that's why I title this message as the hope of Christianity is a hope of a better world. Now, Peter, the beloved disciple, is one of the first disciple uh, who could uh, go to the tomb and saw the empty tomb and the burial clothes of Jesus nicely folded and kept. And he ran away and spoke to the other people. And who is this Peter? This Peter has denied Jesus three times. This Peter has been so impulsive earlier, but that resurrection scene that Peter saw brought in a renewed hope that it is not like what we thought Jesus died, but he rose again. He's not like any other uh, politician or a religious person, but he's something beyond the grave that brought in renewed hope for the first century followers of Jesus. When Jesus died, if the disciples, the, especially the male disciples had scattered, the resurrection scene gathered the disciples back. And these disciples, Jesus appeared to them one by one. First to the women, then to Peter and John. And then Jesus appeared to the 11. And then he appeared to many other, more than 500 eyewitnesses. Because the Jesus community was growing. And everybody who heard about Jesus, they were gathering. Because there is hope in Christianity. There is hope in Jesus. Come on, Jesus is resurrected. And more than 500 people of Jesus community had gathered even before he ascended to heaven. And that Jesus community, that Jesus movement started growing after the resurrection because there is hope. And today we are part of that Jesus movement because of that first century resurrection of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So whenever they used to meet for prayer and gatherings, they used to always talk about this eyewitnesses testimony or my own testimony of seeing the open grave. And talking about the resurrection and preaching about the resurrection was a common day affairs for them. Not only on the Easter Sunday morning. And you look at the writings of the New Testament. Every writing has the reflection of the resurrection. Because it was the resurrection that gave them hope in the time of persecution. And look at Peter and the writings of the New Testament. Peter, in his epistle of 1 Peter, writing to the uh, church in uh, Asia Minor, in the present day Turkey, Peter had grown up to be a tall leader of the new church and he's become a pastor figure. 
and when the church after 30 years of jesus uh, resurrection in ad 62 63 uh, when the church was going through state oriented persecution by the romans and the jews peter is writing this epistle to such people now why did the romans come after the church you see christianity is a, or the jesus followers is a group of people firstly who came out of the judaism they were worshiping in the temple but they came out of that and judaism was accepted by rome as a official religion and christianity was never recognized so rome looked at christianity in a very critical angle and jewish people also looked at christianity in a very critical way because most of their followers are now following jesus so what happened the rome and jewish people started uh, colliding together and started persecuting the jews who became christians dragging them out of their houses burning them at stake giving to wild animals who have not eaten for many days and people believers of jesus were losing the loved ones they were afraid to come to church they were afraid to tell that they were christians and peter is writing to such fearful christians in spite of following christ and he is writing to them to encourage them and the first word in first peter chapter 1 after the introduction he talks about the resurrection of the lord jesus christ today the word of hope and consolation for a troubled world is the resurrection of the lord and savior jesus christ there is no other hope for this fallen world what kind of hope that is it is a hope that will never fade in a, a couple of years back i went to nandi hills church people i like people there's so much of energy that i get i'm a people person i talk to people i talk to strangers i talk to every one of you i get my energy because i'm a people person but sometimes i need breaks and very rarely we go as family but we go and i took my family to nandi hills so that i can have some time off you know what greeted us in nandi hills lord of monkeys we want a time out of people but then we are greeted by a lot of monkeys over there and uh, as we were driving up nandi hills we saw some beautiful lily blooms one particular season you find this all over nandi hills roadside so i was so fascinated by it and i stopped the car and i took this seeds and the the the, the thing in under it the bulb under it and came and planted in my small area near my house so that every morning i can come out and see this bloom and be happy for a couple of weeks i watered it and thought that it was going to grow and sprout but after a couple of weeks i lost interest because it's not growing i thought it's all dead and i just left it so we started not to water it we stopped watering it and we started walking on that ground it became hard crusted and time went on and we forgot everything the very next year this around the same time one morning i'm just walking out of my house and i can see a green sprout with a bud all of a sudden out of the ground the next day morning it's bloomed it is the lily again i thought it is dead buried but now it has come back in its full bloom and it is as beautiful as it was looking before this is a small picture of the resurrection because this lily is not the final lily it is again going to die but the resurrected body will have a glorified body but will look similar to what we are the same person of our who we are and that is a body that will not go back to decay because god has dealt with that punishment on the cross of calvary so now i want you to concentrate on first peter and see what peter is talking about this living hope in first peter chapter 1 and this verse 3 praise be to god and the father of our lord jesus christ in his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of jesus christ from the dead So Peter speaks about the hope to those troubled people and what kind of hope is that living hope and when it will be revealed it is received to us through the resurrection given by God the father through his mercy the motive behind giving us that hope and resurrection and new birth is because of the mercy of God the father we were like the blind bartimaeus son of david have mercy on us we were without mercy we were sinners destined to die but god in his mercy allowed jesus to die and by that rebirth when we receive jesus into our lives and we have that new life experience of rebirth what is happening we are receiving a living hope at the return 
because of the res resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, which will be revealed in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter, listen to me, brings the beautiful tension of this woman, okay, who is filled with fear and joy to these people who are persecuted in the first century around AD 62, 63, talking about what is the tension in which you live in this world and wait for that living hope. And he brings out two beautiful metaphors. Open your Bibles with me to 1 Peter and let us see how he is encouraging this group of people to hold on to that living hope in spite of what they are suffering in this life. It says uh, in chapter 1 and this verse 4, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. So that living hope is an inheritance. So what is an inheritance? Today is Easter Sunday. Most of you may want to have a good biryani and then go back to your uh, home, take some rest. And evenings you may want to visit some malls and enjoy this holiday. Nothing wrong with that, okay? So what happens? Your pocket is full and by the time you come out of that mall, you have spent a lot of money. That's what happens. But what if your money is put in the bank, SBI or HDFC, and you put it in the fixed deposit and it's in a locker? You cannot touch it. You have locked it for some time. It is an inheritance that can never be touched. It will never decrease its value and it will never fade away. It's not like the money on your pocket. And in the Bible, Peter speaks about our living hope as an inheritance which cannot be touched by anybody. And it can not fade away. It will not spoil. It will not get old. God has reserved it for us. Where is it? In heaven. It is kept in heaven for you. It's not that it is going to be kept in heaven and you need to go to heaven and get that inheritance. When Christ comes, he will bring that inheritance with him. You understand? When Christ comes back for the second time, he will bring all that inheritance and he will give us that inheritance. But it is showing a picture. It's a metaphor to show that it is kept safe. You who believe in Jesus Christ, you have a living hope, a glorified body, an eternal salvation, okay? A complete experience of salvation and having the new body experience of a human being given by Jesus Christ at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So on one side, he's encouraging them. Hold on, you have an inheritance. The second metaphor is an interesting metaphor. The second metaphor is in uh, verse 7. Read from verse 6. They are going through trials. And Peter says, in this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while. So somebody say little while. Our trials are for a little while. Our limitations are for a little while. Our pain is for a little while. Dear loved one, if you have lost your loved one because of COVID, this year we have buried people. Your pain is for a little while. That's the, what the Bible speaks over here. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to had suffer griefs in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, the second metaphor, gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proven genuine and may result in praise, glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So Peter is giving the second metaphor. On one side, our hope is secure, an inheritance which will never fade away. But on the other side, our hope is like the gold ring that you wear on that wedding day when your wife puts that ring or your husband exchanges that ring you take care of that ring because you have brought it with a lot of money and then the person who has given you that ring has brought in value to you. So you value that ring. So will you keep that ring in the chair and go when you finish your service and go? Does anybody do that? You all are staring at me. We are not asking for your gold, by the way. Okay? But do you treat that ring uh, shabbily and not take care of it? You do you keep it anywhere and go? No. You value it. It's precious for you. It's precious for you. Why? Because you have paid money and somebody valuable has given you that ring. And Peter is giving us that metaphor about our Christian life. How do you get that gold ring which is in your finger? Somebody has gone to the gold mines and dug out earth. Filthy, dusty, dirty. 
but they found value in that earth and brought it to the factory. This is what God did to us. We were in filth and dirt, condemned because of sin. God in his love has come to the depth and mined us out of the evil of this world. Why? Because he finds worth and value in that dirt. And what happens to that? They bring it to the factory and it goes through crushing. It's painful. Crushing is not easy. Do you think that they're crushing it to hurt the gold? No. That crushing is to refine it. We don't like that crushing experience, isn't it? When life brings crushing experiences, pain and rejections. But the, my master is working in us like a refiner's fire. Not because he does not love us, but because we are of higher value. He's doing something in us in the process. And it's not done. They put that into a high heated furnace, high temperature where everything melts. Oh, it's unbearable. Why am I going through this fire? I do not know why people reject me always. I do not know why I have to deal with this always. But the master sees gold over there, something of value. And after it is melted, they put a chemical and separate gold and the impurities. And that pure gold is put into a mold where that ring is made. And then it becomes so precious. And Peter says, you have an inheritance in heaven. But in this world, as you go through various kinds of trials and rejections and loss and pain, you have been purified, not because he is not liking you, because you are precious in the sight of God. And that is going to be a little while. And when you are refined, you will be that precious gold in my sight. So look at the tension. Being a child of God does not mean that we are immune to the problems of this world. Some people say that you come to faith and receive Christ and that will be everything is going to turn around for you. No, Jesus did not promise that. We will have the sorrows and troubles of this fallen world. But we are in the hands of the refiner who is carrying us, carefully allowing everything planned so that we can be refined to the perfect vessel he wants to make us. Dear friends, I was speaking about the linear growth of technology and digital technology and then Steve Jobs and you die and psh, everything goes down, right? When a child is born into this world, the child is given a lot of things. A family he never chose. Siblings he or she never chose. The inheritance of the parents, we never chose that. So from the birth of a child, the child is accumulating things, gathering things, relationships, inheritance, people, siblings. And then the child goes to school. So there is a linear growth. Accumulating knowledge, college, knowledge. And then the child graduates from college and gets into work. Now, he has got a career. Salary is coming. So the, our life in this world is a life of accumulation of things. That's how it is. And then with that money, we buy our cars and our gadgets. Nothing wrong. That's the way the world works. And we are a part of this system. And then again that child gathers a partner, life partner. There is somebody to care for. I know she is for me and he is for me. So I am gathering things. And then we produce children. So I have got more things. Then we invest in a land or an apartment. And we have gadgets and dresses. So our life in this world as we accumulate things is a linear progression of prosperity and blessings. But there comes a time at the peak of that graph where it starts descending. 
you will retire one day you are not able to go to your office anymore why because you have crossed that age of retirement no job so all that was accumulated one by one starts coming down the graph comes down you are not able to play that instrument anymore your sons and daughters will walk out of the main door of your house they are married off detachment one of the spouse will die you ask your grandfather grandmother whether this is the reality of life and then all of us will come to a position where we are dependent on others even to go to the toilet everything that we gained we will lose up until the grave so if in this world of ifs we are living if my hope is in my job my relationships my assets my talent all this inheritance will fade but as you are accumulating these things in this world knowing that this has been a gift given to you and this don't become your idol but you are focusing on the eternal inheritance when things starts losing you will be able to handle it knowing that this is a way of life and i have an inheritance even greater than that which is waiting for me in heaven victor frankl was a prisoner of war from austria brought into an a concentration camp by the nazis and he went through hardships if you see some pictures of this austrian working hard for the nazis building railroads and connectivity in the concentration camps and he said in two and a half years in that concentration camp he lost everything his family his money his everything property everything and people hardly any people survived out of the concentration camp and he was one of the few and he reflects after coming out of the camp his hope what kept him going during the tough time in that camp and victor frankl writes that as a prisoner of war i had my day to day duties every day in the daytime in the camp but i am a psychiatrist by profession i used to practice uh taking therapy for people and evenings i would take private therapy for my fellow prisoners of war secretly and their case studies i would write down and i would hide it from the nazis under my carpet and when i saw how people are uh, progressing that gave me a hint of how man can have hope in spite of the circumstances around them or difficulties around them out of that camp he says that there were people who lost hope and they were behaving like animals instinct fighting with the nazis and they have no hope they died you know the animals your dog does not care about whether the neighboring dog loves that dog or not your dog does not care about life after death live by instinct and those people who lived by instinct in that camp died perished and then there are a group of people in that camp who uh were very apathetic they were telling that no oh, whatever happens is happened and nothing is going to happen out of my life so they just succumbed to that loss of hope and they died then there was a group of people who had false hopes they started thinking that the war will get over in 6 months they started thinking to themselves that okay uh, i have lost my family but i am not going to think i have lost my family i am not going to think i lost my property they kept pro- positive confession which is what happens in many such present day uh, sermons positive confessions but what happened Victor Frankl says that they survived to come out of the camp but the moment they went back to their homes and saw that everything is destroyed and there is no relationships and everybody is gone within a couple of months they died why because they had a false notion that everything is fine just confess it and uh, things will be fine so positive confession does not work so Victor Frankl finally gives us the reason how man can find hope he said my hope was found in rediscovering my career i found purpose for living in the camp and beyond by giving therapy to the people there was a baker who would bake bread every day that's all his job 
but the purpose of feeding these prisoners of war gave him purpose to survive beyond this time and there was a musician who would go around and play music to these people when they were depressed and this musician survived so victor frankl talks about a hope that is beyond that circumstances and that's the hope that peter talks about beyond this world that the world can give there is hope available at the return of the lord jesus christ there is a living hope and now we are being refined in the process by like gold refined in fire so how do we live how do we transit from this process of this life into that living hope until christ comes or until our death peter gives us a clue very quickly we will finish verse 6 in this you greatly rejoice so our transition when these things are taken away from our life when the graph comes down you don't have to lose your joy there is that christian joy and that peace in verse 8 it talks about you're filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy in the midst of all that is happening to us we have joy why because of the resurrection and the living hope now what kind of joy is that christianity's joy is it that you lose your job on friday and you come on church on sunday and you jump and you worship and you act as if everything is fine and you have the joy is that the joy that the bible is talking about just have the faith man come on worship and be joyful is that christianity is that what the bible says i don't think so i don't think so when you nullify and numb those feelings of man suffering and you say i have faith the god of the bible does not talk that god of the bible understands human suffering and pain there is lament and how do we process with that life then look at jesus when did he suffer the most in the garden of gethsemane on the cross of calvary did jesus tell his disciples hey man i'm going to die come on laugh everybody laugh did jesus say that did jesus say that yes or no what did jesus do his sweat became droplets of blood he was in anguish and he cried to god the father if it is possible i can't bear it lord it's a lament by the way jesus did not have any words to speak when he was going through this tough time what did he speak in the garden of eden and on the cross not his words it is a borrowed words of the psalmist because he does not know what to pray he does not know what to talk my god my god why have you forsaken me lord i don't see you in this place but i know you are there he doesn't know what to pray and what to talk so there is that lament but he said not my will let your will be done father into your hands i commit my spirit that sweet assurance that when we go through that loneliness and that pain that christ is with us gives us that inexpressible and glorious joy in the inside and that's how we are to walk our days we know that we have a living hope we know that we have been going through the refiner's process in this world but god is with us i am with you always to the very end of the age and i will go through this world trusting in that living hope thanking god for those material goods but they are not my idols my jesus is the one i worship and i will pass through no matter what happens that's why paul says whether heights or depths whether in need or in want whether naked or in plenty i will trust in god no matter i have that joy inexpressible joy in my life praise the lord the resurrection is a renewed hope for a new humanity and a hope for a better world i just want to quickly talk about the world and i want to conclude now come with me to romans chapter 8 and this was 22 to 23 is a hope for a better world we know that the whole creation has been groaning in sin we are groaning and not only we because of the fall the creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time not only so but we ourselves who are the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption to sonship for the coming of the lord redemption of our bodies for our resurrection 
for our translation into our glorious body. So who all are groaning? In this flesh, we are groaning and the nature is groaning. So when Christ comes back again, he's going to reform, renew the human body and he's going to renew planet earth and the nature. Come with me to last verse, Revelation chapter 21. And it's verse 1 and 2. Then I saw a new heaven and new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Now listen to me very carefully. When somebody dies, what do we tell? So and so has passed away. But when that person resurrects in the coming of Christ, it is a different person or the same person? Tell me. Same person. So when the Bible says, a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, means what happens at the coming of Christ? Just like our past believers who have died and who have resurrected, the same person is coming. The same earth and heaven is being renewed at the coming of Christ. Our inheritance is kept in heaven, but it will be revealed to us at the coming of Christ. Christ comes with our inheritance. And when he comes, look at that, what he says. Verse 2, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for a husband. We are getting back to the presence of God in the Garden of Eden, where God coming down, heaven came down and glory filled my soul, where there is going to be a new you, new family, new humanity, the same us being translated in the glorified body and this nature which is groaning will be renewed at the coming of Christ. Hope for a better world is possible because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ.